1. Ephesians chapter 1. We will be resuming our study there in uh, just a moment. In Ephesians chapter 1, before we get into chapter 1 uh, and continue our discussion there, we want to look through our outlines. Uh, and we've got a couple of example outlines as well as the outline we're following in the book. Uh, and then uh, we'll get into a quick review of the first part of chapter 1, and then um, a quick review of the first part of chapter 1, and then we'll, we'll uh, try to get through the rest of the chapter this, uh, this morning. The book of Ephesians is about Christ and the church. Uh, and so uh, the key verse, we, as I mentioned the other day, is chapter 5 and then verse 32. It's a, it's a text in which we often talk about, uh, we go to, when we talk in that context about the marriage relationship, where we have the comparison of marriage and of uh, Christ and the church. And in verse 32, Paul said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And we said that's the key verse, that's the theme of the whole book. Uh, we showed this outline by Melvin Gordick. I made you Christians 1 through 3, so act like Christians 4 through 6. And then Wendell Winkler's outline, the church is God's eternal scheme 1 through 3, and then the church life therein is 4 through uh, 6. The outline we're following, my outline here, is blessings of Christ 1 through 3. And so we have him talk about the blessing of adoption in uh, chapter 1. Uh, the blessing of being made alive in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Uh, being reconciled 11 through the end of the chapter, in chapter 2. And then chapter 3, the blessing of having that that was once a mystery now be revealed. Then in chapter 4, he talks about walking worthy of our calling in 4 through 6. And so he talks about walking worthy by keeping unity in the first 16 verses. Uh, walk worthy by uh, being different from the world in 17 through 32. The first 21 verses of chapter 5 is about walking worthy by being imitators of God. 22, uh, chapter 5, verse 22 through chapter 6, verse 9 is walking worthy by being what we all in our relationships. The husband, wife, parent, child, master, servant relationship. And then uh, walking worthy by putting on the armor of God in chapter 6, uh, 10, through, uh, 10 through 24. Uh, this is the map we saw again the other day. Uh, Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, so it's the one right here that's highlighted uh, in red on, uh, on the map. Now, Ephesians chapter 1 is about blessings in Christ. Getting back to chapter 1 now. Uh, the, sometimes within a section, we have a, uh, a section that, that kind of captures the whole, or, or a title that captures the whole of a section. So the first three chapters are all about blessings. But then in chapter 1, he introduces the idea of blessings in Christ. So chapter 1 is also about blessings in Christ. Now obviously there's different blessings listed in each one. But chapter 2, you're made alive. Chapter 3, uh, the mystery is about the mystery. But chapter 1 is blessings in Christ. Then, when we break that down further, the first 14 verses, he deals with blessings in Christ. There's an introduction. But then in verse 3, he talks about how all the blessings are in Christ. And then he lists some of those in chapter 1. Uh, mostly, we, we, we titled this section, chapter 1, he deals with it being adopted. Uh, but he deals with a few other blessings in chapter 1. Than just that. So, uh, chapter 1 is a, uh, a detailed look at blessings, though that's what the whole section of the first three chapters is about. He deals specifically with that more here in chapter 1, where he introduces that idea and makes the point in the first 14 verses that you have blessings in Christ. In fact, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. We'll come back to that in a moment. Beginning of verse 1 now, uh, we'll quickly review. We got down to verse 7, but we'll quickly review the first six verses. Verse 1 and 2 uh, is his introduction. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's Paul's uh, customary introduction here in the first uh, two verses. In verse 3, then, he makes the point about all blessings being in Christ. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We pointed out on Sunday, as we were introducing that, this section, that there are two important words that if you highlight or underline in your Bible, you might want to highlight or underline. The first of those is the word every. And again, as we did Sunday morning, we'll come back to that in a second. The second of those is in Christ. So where are spiritual blessings found? In Christ. How many spiritual blessings? Well, it's every spiritual blessing. And as we mentioned on Sunday, if every spiritual blessing is in Christ, that leaves no room anywhere else for spiritual blessings. They're all in Christ. Well, then beginning at verse 4, he deals with the first specific blessing we have in Christ. And that is we have been adopted as sons of God. And so for verses 4 through 6, he said, Just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us at, uh, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And so as we pointed out on Sunday morning, uh, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Uh, if we were to go back to the outline uh, that uh, was given by uh, Wendell Winkler, his outline said the church is God's eternal scheme, one to three, and then life to one to six. It's God's eternal scheme. It wasn't, as some say, that the church was just sort of a placeholder because God's plan didn't go exactly as he thought it would. No, this was God's plan from before the foundation of the world. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He predestined us, but to adoption. And so as we talked about the other day, there are those who talk about us being predestined, and then their, their idea is, you're chosen to be saved, and you're not. And you're chosen to be saved, but you're not. And then he chose individually who would be saved and who would not. As we said, that violates other biblical principles. In Romans 2 and in verse 11, he said, there is no partiality with God. Peter would point that out as well in Acts chapter 10 and 34 and 35 as he taught the house of Cornelius. He didn't predestine, well, this person is saved and this person is lost. He predestined us to adoption. Now, what does that mean? He predestined that if you do what I uh, demand and command of you, you can be adopted as my children. And so we pointed out that this idea of adoption, we, it should not be unfamiliar to us. Uh, we dealt with it sometime back in Romans. Uh, but we looked at Galatians 3 the other day. And mentioned how not all just a couple of weeks ago, when we were in Galatians 3, that Paul pointed out, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ, for as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so it's adoption, but there is a process by which we get adopted as children of God. If somebody wants to adopt a child in our society, there's a, a, a legal system that has to be gone through for them to be able to adopt. Well, if somebody wants to, if we want to be adopted as children of God, he said, here's the criteria. When we do that, then we are adopted, but only when we do that. And so he predestined us, but not that one would be saved and another lost. He predestined those who did his will would be adopted as his son, and they would have life. He then said in verse 6, to the praise of him, uh, of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And so now he says we are accepted. Then in verse 7, he comes to the next blessing. All blessings are in Christ. We have been blessed with being adopted. We have been blessed with having redemption, 7 through 12. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we... Uh, who first trusted in Christ should be put to the, the praise of his glory. And so verse 7, what's the next blessing? We have redemption through his blood, that is, we have the forgiveness of sin. Uh, remember in, in Acts chapter 4, as Peter was uh, before the Sanhedrin council and they were being questioned, 
He made the point when they were asked about how this lame man was healed, that it was in the name of Christ this man stands before you whole. He is the, the stone which you, the builders, rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation in no other. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. We have redemption through his blood. That's how we have the forgiveness of sins, and we only have that through his blood. The Hebrew writer, whoever he may be, uh, I think it's probably Paul. That's a discussion for another time. But the Hebrew writer, whoever he is, uh, would make the point uh, in dealing with the old law, is dealing with people that are trying to go back, and he's pointing out Christ is better, that he said the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins. The only sacrifice sufficient to take away sins is the sacrifice of Christ. That's how we have redemption. Which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, verse 8, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Now we're going to come back to the mystery in a few chapters. As we said earlier, chapter 3, we have the blessing of that which was a mystery is now revealed. Uh, why is it called a mystery? Well, if it's been revealed, because if it's revealed, then we know it, right? Why is it a mystery? Because it once was not known. It was a mystery. And it's the thing, as we pointed out in the scriptures, that angels want to look into. This is something that was a mystery, but now is revealed. And what he said here is having made known to us the mystery of his will. Now that itself, verse 9, is one of the other spiritual blessings we have in Christ. As we said, that's what chapter 3 is going to deal with. But he introduces it here and says, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. So he's made known the mystery. Now there are a lot of things and parts of the scripture that is a mystery, but one is that all things that he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Uh, you go later on into chapter 2, and in verse 11 he said, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So not only is there redemption, is there forgiveness of sins, in the sense that all can have that. But remember this, under the old law, who were God's chosen people? It was the Jews. Who are we dealing with mostly at Ephesus? We're dealing with Gentiles. Again, verse 11. Uh, Therefore remember that you want Gentiles in the flesh. But now they're gathered together. That mystery of the fact that God would accept was really, uh, he had alluded to and, and made the point of several times, but it was hidden from the eyes there. Uh, even those that were followers of Christ uh, didn't fully see it. Uh, and that's why in Acts 15 and that Jerusalem discussion takes place. Is that you know, the mystery is now revealed. He's gathered all things to himself. Now those Jew and Gentile alike who would serve him can have forgiveness of sins. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Uh, remember this in, in, in Galatians. As we dealt with Galatians, we, we contrast, we saw the contrast. There is those that are children by promise and children by flesh. Right? And, and, and the allegory was used of Hagar and Sarah and their children, Ishmael and Isaac. And Ishmael was Abraham's child, but he was his child according to what? Flesh. Isaac was a child according to promise. Isaac being according to promise was an heir. Ishmael was not. What does the heir have? He has the inheritance. Right? So uh, you go back to chapter 3 in Galatians. You're adopted and now you are an heir. You come here to Ephesians. You're adopted and now you have an inheritance. Very similar point being made. In him also we obtain an inheritance. Being predestined according to the purpose of him. Who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So uh, you're predestined to this inheritance. Again, how are we predestined? Well, not your saved and your laws. Right? That would contradict other scriptures. But go back in the context to the last time he used that word predestined. We were predestined to be adopted, so predestined to adoption. Those who were predestined to be adopted uh, to adoption, that is, those that followed his will to be adopted as sons, they also have an inheritance. 
right? The inheritance is for those that are the children. So we've been predestined to this inheritance according to the purpose of his will. Now in verse 13 and 14, he gets to the last of these uh, blessings in this chapter. Really the end of this chapter, by the way, we'll get to it in a minute, is not dealing with blessings, it's a prayer of Paul. Uh, but it is in this section where we're mostly dealing with these blessings. But 13 and 14, before he gets to that, uh, he talks about that the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance. In him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in him also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The first thing we want to look at is in verse 13. In him uh, you also trusted after you heard the word of salvation, uh, the gospel of truth, in him also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Um, think for just a second about this idea of being sealed. Uh, to think about it from the standpoint of as you read through the Old Testament, remember there was the, uh, with the Medes and the Persians, they would sign a law into effect, and then the king would use his signet ring, right, to say, he's really, it's him giving his stamp of approval. And once the king gave his signet ring under the laws of the Medes and the Persians, that law was in effect and could not be removed. Um, so, you think about a seal in that sense. Here's the seal, the, the signet. And what he's saying is the Holy Spirit is our seal. Now, it's pointed out in uh, Truth's commentary on the book of Ephesians. It's pointed out uh, on this verse, there are five things that it shows us about the idea of being sealed. Being sealed shows five things. Uh, and uh, for time's sake, we won't go through the uh, intricate details that are put in there. If you want to, see, if you have truth commentary, you look at it, and it'll it'll break it down and have more explanation. And it, and it uses it to the sense of which a seal is used in society, maybe when a package is sealed or something. And the idea of here's what it what it means. And so he draws that analogy out for it. And I'll bring up those five things and quickly uh, quickly explain them this evening. Uh, the first of those it points out is the seal shows completion. That is, it shows a final line, when a seal is used in our society, and, and again, in the idea of this package being in transit, it shows a finalized transaction. Uh, it shows authentication. We're authentically, we're really the children of God. It shows appropriation. We're God's, that we are God. It shows the security we have as protection and then the confirmation. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, it's explained in more detail in that commentary if you, if you want to read through that. But it, it, it parallels uh, the way that it's used. But just remember the five things. A seal shows completion, authentication, appropriation, security, and confirmation. And so when you have that seal of the Spirit, uh, the seal of the Holy Spirit, it's saying you're, the, you're really the children of God. You're His. He's going to be with you. Well, he ties that in verse 13. He says He's the seal who is the guarantee. So that seal, right, the completion, authentication, appropriation, security, and confirmation it gives, it serves then as a guarantee, a down payment, or earnest. A BDAC says it's a payment of part of a purchase price in advance. A first installment, deposit, a down payment, or a pledge. I believe it's the word usury in the, the King James or something like that. Think about it this way. When you go... You've heard me, I think you've heard me use this before. If you go to purchase a, uh, a new vehicle, maybe you're purchasing a new house, and, and you go to uh, the bank for the loan or you go to wherever you're buying it from, you take some money and you put it down as a down payment. Right? There's a down payment. And what you're saying is this payment is a sign of what? More to come. Right? I'm gonna, here's the down payment. And it's sort of that sign of more to come. The point is, the Spirit is our guarantee. It's the payment of the part of the purchase. As the guarantee, or the first installment, there's going to be more to come. What's the more to come? He's the guarantee of our inheritance. How do you know you have the inheritance? You have the Spirit as the guarantee. Until the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of his glory. 
So somebody says, well, are they, you know, uh, you know you're, really, you're a child of God, and you have that hope of heaven. What he's saying is there's the guarantee of the Spirit that's being shielded by the Spirit and the guarantee of the Spirit. That shows you, guess what, I'm not only making a promise for now, I'm telling you there's more to come. That's ultimately the reward of heaven. Well, then in verse 15, we have a little bit of a shift. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, uh, it, it, it is a prayer of Paul, although there's some connections uh, back to what he said uh, before. Uh, but just quickly, uh, this prayer of Paul, Paul in a lot of his writings, in several of his writings, uh, he comes particularly in the first chapter or so, and he talks about his prayer for those that are there. Uh, some of his other writings, he may have made just a brief mention, my prayer for you, and he gives something. Uh, Paul was somebody that spent a great deal of time in prayer, uh, and not only did he spend a great deal of time in that he prayed often, he spent a great deal of time in prayer in that when you consider how many brethren he told he was praying for, how long he had to spend in prayer to pray for them. And here in, to the church at Ephesus, he talks about his prayer. There are three uh, components to this prayer. Uh, first, he prays without ceasing. He's praying for them and he's praying without ceasing. Secondly, he prays they have wisdom. And then thirdly, he is a prayer concerning God's power. That's very closely connected to that second section, though. And we'll see that when we get to that here in a moment. Uh, I did, uh, as I look through it, uh, if I was going back, I'm, I'm not completely sure yet, but if I was going back as I was going through it in more detail today, I, I might would combine C and B, Paul's prayer for wisdom, and then have three subsections to that. We'll point that out in a minute. But it, though it seems in stark contrast to the rest of the prayer, 19 through 23 is very, very closely connected to the first part of the prayer. But let's start in 15 and 16. Paul prayed and he prayed without ceasing. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love of the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So Paul says he's grateful for those in Ephesus. After hearing of their uh, faith in the Lord, after hearing the love they had for uh, the saints, uh, that he spent time uh, in prayer to God, thankful for them, uh, for their influence, uh, perhaps for their encouragement, uh, for many different things they did in, in helping with the furtherance of the gospel. Uh, but Paul mentions that when he heard of them and their faithfulness to the Lord and their love they had for one another, he prayed for them often. He then in 17 and 18 talks about how he prayed that they have wisdom. He makes mention of them, not just giving thanks, but he makes mention of them that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, uh, you to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. To eyes, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, uh, what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And then verse 19 real quick, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power. That's how they tie together. Paul says, I pray you have wisdom about three things. We'll get to that more in a second. The first of those, he said in verse 17, I pray that God give you uh, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and uh, knowledge. So, uh, real quickly, he talks about that he prays that they have uh, the spirit of wisdom, a spirit of understanding, and a spirit of, of uh, knowledge. And I have somewhere the definition of every one of those typed in. And for some reason, they're not here in the notes. Give me one second. Uh, but what he points out to them is, I, I'm praying that you have these three different things. Um, as, as you break them down, uh, these three things, again, uh, there's knowledge, there's wisdom. This is not the exact word, but knowledge, wisdom, revelation. Revelation is something that is revealed. Uh, knowledge, you, knowledge and wisdom, this is the one I think where we perhaps get the most confused at times. Knowledge is knowing the facts. And wisdom is knowing how to apply the facts. So uh, there are there may be somebody that has great knowledge. If you ask them what does the Bible have to say on some topic, they may be able to tell you exactly what it says. They can, they can fill you in on all this knowledge, all this information. But then uh, when push comes to shove, as we say, when it comes to applying that, when they need to apply that knowledge, then they're just sort of lost on what to do. They may have a lot of knowledge, but they may not have wisdom. And so, uh, 
When he says they have knowledge and wisdom, he prays that they know. Right? They need to know about the truth. They need to know how they need to live. But then have the wisdom to not just know, here's what I need to do and what I don't need to do. Have the wisdom to, when you have to, be able to use that wisdom to apply those facts to live the kind of life that is pleasing to God. Well, when he prays that they have knowledge and wisdom, uh, 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 that they have a spirit of wisdom, revelation, knowledge, is in having their eyes of understanding and enlightenment. If you have a, a Bible based on the critical text, New American Standard, English Standard, Legacy Standard, Christian Standard, so on, pretty much all other translations outside of the King James and New King James, uh, it will use the word heart. Uh, the King James and New King James are not based on the majority text, so that's what we often talk about. They're actually based on the Textus Receptus, which is very similar. But there are a few minor differences. One of the differences is the word ear. The majority text, just like the critical text, uses the word having the eyes of your heart enlightened. Uh, the New King James, uh, based on the Texas Receptus, uses the word understanding. It's a different Greek word uh, that occurs there. But the idea is that you have this knowledge so that your heart can be enlightened, that your eyes uh, can be enlightened, so that you see these three things. The three things are that you can see the hope or know the hope of your calling. So remember, when we get into chapter 4, Paul says, walk worthy of your calling with which you were called. Well, what he says right here is you need to know the hope of your calling. So we come later on, we need to know worthy of our calling, but we need to make sure we're walking worthy because we're aware of the hope of our calling. What's that hope? The hope of heaven. That's the inheritance that we were talking about earlier. That's part of the inheritance. He then says to know what are the riches or the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So there's more than just the hope of heaven. We can be with God forever. Uh, we have the forgiveness of sins. Now, there are a lot of things, but he says he hopes that you know the hope of your calling and you know the riches of the glory of the, the inheritance of the saints. And then finally, that you know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the work of his mighty power. They need a third, and this is why I said if I was going back, I might change this and have the prayer that they have wisdom, and wisdom, understanding, and knowledge about uh, the hope of the calling, about the riches uh, of the inheritance, uh, the glory of the inheritance in the saints, and then have the wisdom and knowledge about the power of God. But then he talks about that you have this knowledge. He then explains some about the power of God. Here's what he says. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. He said in verse 19, God has this exceeding great, the exceeding greatness of his power. He has exceedingly great power. That's what he said. How do I know he has exceedingly great power? Well, the first evidence is he raised Christ from the dead. Suppose for just a minute that miracles could take place today and somebody, you were standing at a funeral home and somebody walked in and raised the person in the casket from the dead. <coughs> if you saw somebody raise that person today, you know they're dead. You know they've been, like, they've been dead uh, for some time and now somebody comes along and that was to raise them from the dead, you would say, man, that person has some great power. And that's the point he's making. God raised Christ from the dead. You want to know and see evidence of his exceedingly great power? He raised Christ from the dead and then seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Uh, this is not a quotation, by the way, but if you if you write out references, if you have a reference Bible where you make notes for references, though it is not always quoted, the most alluded to, I believe it's the most alluded to in the passage in the New Testament is Psalm 110 and in verse Psalm 110 as a whole is referenced several times. Hebrews, he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But one of the ones that is mentioned several times is being seated at the right hand of God. Uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Psalm 110 in verse 1. So he's seated at the right hand of God. Uh, that is not a direct quotation. Uh, there are times there are direct quotations. Why then did he say? And then it's quoted. But then several times it is alluded to. 
Uh, but he's seated at the right hand of God. Once with the death of, of Stephen, he's standing at the right hand of God. Uh, that's in contrast to the sitting the rest of the time. But he's found at the right hand of God, uh, which is a place of, uh, of authority. So he's seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So God has great power. How do I know that he raised Christ from the dead? And Christ is seated at his right hand, far above all principality and power and might, and has all things subjected to him concerning the church. He's put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now, going back to what we said earlier, in verse 3, spiritual blessing and found in Christ, every spiritual blessing. So if every spiritual blessing is in Christ, we can't find one anywhere else. He's put over head over all things concerning the church, right? His body. So if he's head over all things, that means we cannot do anything outside of his authority. Because he's the one that has that authority over all things concerning the church. Verse 23 now, which is his body. So uh, this is why that is important. This is a passage, Ephesians 1, uh, here 22 and 23, and then I think, let me check from here, I think it's Colossians 1, uh, Colossians 1, 18, are two passages that are important to our uh, for this reason. When I get to Ephesians chapter 4 later on, I'm studying Ephesians 4, there's a list of ones, one Lord, one faith, and baptism. Right alongside that, he's going to say there's one body. So when you're talking to somebody about the church, they talk about all these different churches make the point. That's not, this idea of denominationalism, that doesn't fit with the scripture. Christ said, I'm going to establish my church. That's what he said. And then he said, uh, it says in Ephesians, there's one body. And then we can show them the body is the church. Two passages to use. Colossians 1.18. And then Ephesians 1, 22-23. Both of those, by the way, if you notice, that's Ephesians and Colossians, which we mentioned the other day, are two parallel books. A lot of similarities between the two. And so when you're talking to somebody about that, that's a passage you go to to, uh, to make that point. Lord willing, we'll pick up on Sunday morning in uh, chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll continue our discussion of uh, continue our discussion there in Ephesians chapter 2 on Sunday morning.